to this, so, you know, I was cool with the lunch, but um, if you missed anything, talk with um, some folks in your area that came. I know there's some folks that wasn't here yesterday. Make sure you get the handouts. Please take this. I don't want to take them back to the office, so if there's people here that need them um, or that can use what we have, please take them, and then that way I don't have to deal with them, okay? So I'm going to turn it over to Dan and Brian. I should to take that microphone. Was the other one too loud? This one was cutting out, I think. Oh, sis. Well, we'll use it for questions if we need them. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, guys. Um, oh, uh, oh, it's you, you Dan. It's you. It's you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Dan Fox. Uh, this is Brian Miller. We uh, work for DCED. Um, uh, as, you know, one of the state agencies that stands for Department of Community and Economic Development. And uh, Brian, I'm actually going to skip two slides here. Go right to that one, yeah. Um, my job at DCD is, is a strange job in a sense, and, and this... And, <laughs> hello? <laughs> it's strange in the sense that, uh, it, you know what, I'm, maybe I'll just have to yell. She's messing with it. Oh, that was you. Well, screw, screw you. I'm using the other microphone now. <laughs> um, I, this is why Amanda felt comfortable saying what she needed to say in front of in front of us here is because I'm not a typical state employee in the sense that uh, uh, I'm a, a yes man. Uh, we we have an interesting charge to work with uh, the continuums of care, which I'll get to in a second, which are basically homeless systems around Pennsylvania to try to help them coordinate, educate, um, and, and try, in a general sense, to, to have a, a large picture view of addressing challenges of homelessness. One of the things I do under that is um, I run an HMIS system. I stand for Homeless Management Information System. And um, can you pull up the, the map for a second? And Brian here uh, is my lead staff member in the sense that uh, he really helps me day to day oversee um, the usability of the system, keeping it running, working with the programmers. Uh, he's kind of like my right hand man. And I wanted Brian to pull up this map here while we were still thinking about who's on what system. Can you all see that? All the counties that are colored that are not gray are currently using the PA HMIS system. So if you are in one of those counties, you'll be working with us. If you're in one of the gray counties, you'll need to come up and get a handout and we'll be working with your HMIS lead separately. Um, so essentially... Essentially, um, what we do is we, we're kind of a technical assistance group, um, not really, huh? Oh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right, so I'm going to pass these out and uh, looking at the map. I'll kill a little time here. So just a, a brief overview of, of how you guys kind of fit in to a process that's been existing for the last 10 or 12 years or so. Um, through HUD, the top Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development, there's a process set up called the Continuums of Care. And there are regional groups, and you can see how in different colors here they're, uh, they're broken out. There are regional groups whose sole job is, is to address homelessness, a, a group of nonprofit agencies who get funded every year to address homelessness. <coughs> um, in the past, things have been very siloed, and at the federal level, there's a large push to really start to consolidate things, um, uh, federal agencies working together, and essentially forcing us, not that it's a bad thing, but forcing us to work together, too. <coughs> so, uh, so the PATH program is now one of these programs that is going to need to participate in the continuous care process. And this is how essentially we start the HMIS conversation. These continuums of care are required to collect their homelessness data 
in, a, in an HMIS system. And now the PATH program will also be required to do that. Uh, so Amanda and I have been working for the past year or so on, on how to essentially translate the HUD speak and the, uh, the SAMHSA speak into hopefully usable data collection for you guys that integrates into what we're already doing so we can uh, start to see a bigger picture. So one thing I want to say before we kind of get into it is there will be this concept in the system that we'll hammer on a few times and that's kind of your agency versus global or versus system wide. And the reason that there's that concept is because each agency is set up as their kind of own little microcosm of data collection and, and a version of a database that then in order to deduplicate clients to be able to see where clients move, um, we take pieces of your information and create a global version of a client or a client that you all can share uh, to, to help essentially cut down on not only the amount of work you guys do or have to collect, the amount of uh, information you have to collect, but also to make sure that we can uh, see the client for what they really are from all the different aspects of the services they're getting. So the, what you see on the screen here right now, that's actually harder to see than I thought it was going to be. But um, these are our general permission levels. Um, each of you that uses the system will be set up with one of these levels. The top that you see here is the has the least amount of access to the system. Essentially, you have access to create clients and manage data about the clients that you created. Uh, the next level, manage programs. Um, this level and the one above it are really kind of how we're going to get started. Uh, the Manage Programs level has the ability to not only collect client data, but also manage your version of the program, your kind of digital version of the program that's in the system, to be able to set things up um, and uh, also control some, some things about the program. Um, manage Users and Manage Agency are almost the same thing. Manage Users have a little bit less access, but essentially Manage Agency is uh, well, it's what we call the, it's the agency manager, it's the person at your organization who is designated by your organization to control the data collection for your agency. So we're the system administrators, but we'll be working heavily with the agency managers to make sure your programs are set up, make sure your users have the correct access, so forth. Uh, so we have a couple little um, policy-ish things that we need to cover before uh, we start getting in, into a demo. And one of these things is that the HMIS system runs on a policy of implied consent. And what that means is that if a client is accepting services that are paid for with federal dollars, or in this case state dollars too, uh, that the client is consenting to having information stored about them to be able to further understand the nature of the problem. Now, this doesn't mean that they are waiving their rights to privacy. This simply means that you are allowed to enter data into the system about them. Uh, we'll, we'll get into privacy in a little more detail later, but essentially, the we have a privacy policy, and each client who is whose data is shared uh, has to sign a release of information. Also, the one thing that our privacy policy states that you guys will have to do, and we provide a template for, for this, is um, you'll have to post a privacy notice in an easily accessible location, which states essentially what we do and don't do with the data. It's very general, but it's basically a heads up to the clients that walk in the door that, hey, we have this available. If you have a website, you're also required by federal law to put this privacy notice on the website. All right, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Brian here for the first time, where we're going to get into uh, the general information about how to create a client profile. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a quick uh, rundown of what we call the universal data elements. Um, and these are also what we call in the system as kind of client profile data elements. Um, uh, 
this is kind of also for um, the HMIS people that are in their own system to kind of have a template to follow. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to go into um, a demo of the system. So we're going to kind of from here on kind of jump back and forth between slides, some relevant points when we enter and back into a demo. I did want to say one thing. Sure. I, I, I'd like to say just before we even get started that I know that this day is going to be painful. Uh, and, and I really, really feel for you guys. Uh, frankly, we have never offered a training that is, that is in such a large chunk. We always break it up. Uh, we have about 16 hours of total training that we have available. We've done, done our damnedest to shave off anything and, and everything that you don't need to know. Uh, so essentially my point is uh, one of the reasons we're doing this flip-flop thing is to try to help <laughs> Help as much of it stick as possible, but uh, the, the most important thing I wanted to bring up is please, if you have questions, shout them out. Uh, hopefully we can make this a little bit of an interactive session, and so it's not so uh, humdrum that you guys are falling asleep on us here. We, uh, we don't bite, so feel free to ask anything you need. Okay, this is, uh, this is the uh, entry to the HMIS system. Um, it is a web-based application. Um, so you can pretty much get to it anywhere you have a computer and internet. Um, the performance is, you know, related to how well your internet speed is. Um, you've got your basic login where every user has their own username and password. A um, couple ideas uh, here, you know, you can do a lot of things where you, for a lot of you new users where you're setting up new users, you'll basically, we have some instructions on this and everything and we can contact you to, get here, but you basically come here and you can register as well as reset your password. So those are just some uh, um, uh, kind of notes on uh, where it is in the system. Um, this is kind of the URL, and of course we'll give that to you. It's a good idea to put it in your favorites so that you have access to it. Um, what I'm doing is logging in with a um, managed client person, um, kind of like the caseworker, case manager person that does a lot of the data entry for uh, clients. Uh, program enrollment, that sort of thing. <laughs> now, as soon as we log in, this is kind of the first screen that you're going to see. Uh, this is kind of what we call the start page. It um, has a couple different uh, sections to it. Um, as you can see here, we've got kind of like a main alerts that are kind of system alerts for the system that we put out for training information or support or help desk information, training notes, and everything like that. Um, the other part we have here is what we call our action menu. It's our gold action menu, and that's where most of the uh, functions in the system are. Um, so if you're looking to start to do something, you always want to click on this start page. It'll bring you back here in that action menu. Even though it's in most screens throughout the system, um, if you're kind of not sure where to go, usually go back to the start page and you've got these kind of actions where there's search for records, and this is where you can search for clients and households, as well as do creation of new clients um, within the system. And we'll kind of go into all those functions uh, in the demo coming up. Uh, there's a section here called Your Programs and Sites, which basically shows what you have access to. Uh, a lot of people are going to be working in a single agency and maybe have one or two programs specifically. As you can see here, this uh, demo user has uh, got a PATH program. That's what he ministers, puts clients into. Um, we also have uh, the caseload tool. Uh, and this is a very interesting tool where it basically keeps and uh, organizes clients that you're currently working on. Um, kind of a nice um, area to kind of keep track of your clients. Now there's two, two ways that a client can get on your caseload. Any client that you enter into the system automatically gets put on your caseload, of course. As well as in, uh, later when we go through the agency manager functions, uh, managers in the agency have the ability to transfer clients from case manager to case manager. Um, so that can, they can also be assigned to you and they'll show up on your caseload. Uh, we've got some different functions that you can uh, use to view modes and different sorts, um, as well as some time functions to try to keep your caseload as relevant um, as possible. <clears throat> um, and it also allows you to load clients by just simply clicking on them 
um, right there on the screen, and it'll load what we call their client profile that we'll get to in a second. Um, one other kind of global note is when you log into the system, the system kind of keeps track of who's logged in when. So anytime you're done using the system, you have to make sure that you specifically use this logout function. Um, basically, you'll click it, it'll ask you, hey, you sure you want to log out? Um, don't just close the browser or navigate to Google or another website because the system will think you're still logged in. So if you shut it down and try to log in, the system will say, hey, you're still logged in. Um, so try to remember to use that. Now, if you do get locked out, it's not the end of the world. Um, we have an automatic process that kind of pulls clients, our users, um, and after about 30 minutes, if it notices that you're still logged in but not in the system, it will reset your account. Now, if it's normal business hours, you can always contact the help desk and we'll go ahead and unlock your account. <clears throat> now we're going to get into uh, some client search, client creation processes. Um, right here is basically one of the actions on your action menu is the uh, new client. Um, basically, when you click that, it kind of brings you uh, to a client search. Um, one of the main features of an HMIS system is client deduplication. So we have a lot of processes in the system that tries to make sure that if you're trying to enter a new client in the system, you go through a bunch of checks to make sure that that client isn't already in the system in your agency. So that's why anytime you're you know, meeting with a new client, you, you need to do a search first. And we've got a bunch of different fields. You, know, you can search by social security number, last name, first name, date of birth, um, client ID if you have that. We always recommend trying to fill in as much information that you have about the client as possible. So we're going to kind of go through a little demo. Um, we've got a guy, Ben Smith, that we're going to go ahead and uh, try to enter into the system. So what the system does at this time is it does a search of basically two different areas. Kind of how Dan mentioned, we have agency, uh, clients and agency searches, as well as global searches. Uh, now, the agency search basically looks for clients that have the same relative, you know, last name, first name, within your agency. Any matches that come up will show up within this area. Um, now, anybody that has shared data throughout the system globally um, has information come up down in these what we call global records. Now, the global records are basically pieces of shared data throughout the system from visiting other agencies in the system. And don't worry, we're going to get to how data is shared in a little bit here. Um, what we always recommend is if you're entering a new client, if no, you know, no agency results come up, you know, that means he's not in your agency, you can go ahead and um, create them brand new. As you can see here, we've got a Ben Smith here. Here we have a Benjamin Smith in the agency, so you can check their date of birth, social security number to see if that is your client. If it is, uh, we don't want you to create a new client. We want you to reuse that client profile because uh, we kind of go by a rule that each agency has a single client per agency where you can attach all the data to, whether it's um, all the program enrollments, contacts, that sort of thing. Um, now, in this example, uh, we're not going to select Benjamin Smith, even though that is our client, because I want to show you a couple of the other uh, uh, deduplication features we have in the system. So we're going to pretend, oh, that's not the guy we want. We're going to go ahead and create a new client. So when this option comes up, it basically takes us to a template of the client profile. Now, the client profile is kind of broken up into four different main areas. The client information, uh, contact information, physical characteristics, as well as additional client information. And each of those sections has specific personal information about that client. <clears throat> now, when you're creating a client initially, um, the only information that is 100% required to create a client is the agency, that you need to associate them to. And a lot of times, users are only associated to a single organization, so that's already going to be selected for you. And a first name and a last name. Um, once you have that information, that is the minimum amount of information that needs to be put in to create a new client. Um, now, of course, we always want you to put in as much information as you can collect 
um, from clients, but we understand in the outreach world, um, you kind of collect information little by little. So this, this kind of gives you an option to create the client, put it into the system, and uh, as you get more meetings with them or more contacts, you kind of build their profile on the fly. Sure. No, you need to enter something into the first name and the last name field. Don't forget to repeat the question. Um, she asked this, uh, we're creating a client, can you just use the alias fields? Um, unfortunately, no, there's got to be something in those name fields. Now, if you don't have a name, you can use something like client one, client, you know, some kind of identifier in the field, but as long as there's got to be at least a character in each field for it to save. So, Wait, let me, let me do the mic. I guess I won't be getting my nap today. <laughs> getting your exercise. <laughs> That's the real reason we kept you around today, Amanda. <laughs> um, my question is, if I'm not creating a new profile for someone, I go in and I see that profile was created by somebody that I don't know, and then I create something else, 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 Mm -hmm. If I change the information from me, will I also change the information that he presented at the Delta and affect the other agency's data because that's going to be different for them than it is for myself? Or you're not ready to discuss that? No, that's well, a good question. It's a good question. I'm not quite ready for it. However, this actually plays into what I was talking about, global versus agency earlier. Essentially what the system does is each client is associated with an agency. So in your example, where a client was created at another agency, you technically don't have ownership over that client record. However, if the data is shared, you can view it. So if you find a record that already exists, you'll be able to import the information that's available into your agency, but it's two separate copies of the same client that the system knows is the same client. And so essentially the answer to your question is yes, you can change the information, and what it will do is it won't change the other agency's information, but it alerts them that the information has been updated. And also kind of to add on to that, now if it is the client in your agency, um, everybody, no matter if you have two users in the agency or ten users, do share the same client profile in that agency. So, uh, an example, say, the contact information is filled out, but now you've got new updated information. We want you to update it to the best information you have so that everybody in the agency, when they view that client, knows what the best and latest information is. Um, now we're going to kind of quickly go, and a lot of the fields are pretty self-explanatory. Um, the main client information field, okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. She, she can yell, right? We'll repeat it. Don't you want to repeat it? Yeah, we'll repeat, we'll repeat yeah. it. I, I did forget to mention, part of the reason why uh, we have the texture microphone and why we're repeating questions is because you guys will probably forget a lot of this and we are recording it so we'll make it available online. So if you can't remember everything, don't stress about it. I just want to clarify, um, is that the login is based on A and B not on individual logins? So when you have, you have two separate agencies that are working with the same client, like you said before, you have one agency login, uh, put the client in, they're in ownership of that particular client information. When the other agency logs in, they see the client, it's you know, shared with them, but it's, 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 it's two separate, but it has, but it's the system knows it's one. Exactly. You got it. Yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, each agency is going to kind of have their own environment and clients. Now, since that client has the same information, kind of above the top, the system is going to kind of link them, but they're very separate entities. Okay. The funny thing is, we cut this out of the training because we didn't think you guys would care. <laughs> good. But, uh, but yeah, uh, the the reason we do it that way is is so that the system can tell who is the same while at the same time protecting the client data. And again, when we get to the data sharing, you'll be able, it'll make more sense, you'll be able to see how you're able to control what is, what is shared and what is not shared. My question, my question is about um, two caseworkers, one agency, they're both under consumers, they can see each other's and touch each other's consumers' information? 
Yes, from a client profile standpoint, they can. Now, when we show later, so because a client is kind of a global, you know, within the agency, you know, the profile information is, you know, information like contact, race, gender, it's pretty much going to be the same, you know, in the agency. But at the beginning when you searched, it came up with your caseload. Is that for your agency or for that's, your... That's for you yes. as an individual. Okay, so that's right. Then how do I see my coworkers' caseload? Well, within the caseload, those are clients in your agency assigned specifically to you. Right. Now, if there's another client in that agency assigned to another worker, yes. they won't be on your caseload, but you can do a client search, and they'll come up in the search. And you can edit them in order. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, it, they don't have to be on your caseload for you to touch them. Is the caseload is just a way to kind of a quick link, you know, it's an extra feature, so you don't have to do a search. Kind is of. there a search that would show your whole, all the consumers for your agency? Yep. Okay. Sorry, where is it? If, if you were to essentially search for a client, not type anything in, and just hit the search button, every client would come up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you basically do a blank search. You know, hit a space and it all pop up. <laughs> My question would be, if you're keeping two duplicate records, like on the question that she asked, if, if there's updates made, it'll keep two copies of the same record. So if I'm going in and we have something maybe from someplace else who has been updated a few times, how are we going to know which is the most up-to-date, say, demographic information? Within your agency, you're only going to have one record. In technically, in there. They're, they're technically not two copies of the same record. They're technically two separate records that we use an algorithm to link together. So the system knows that they are two versions of the same client, but we don't want to allow someone at another agency to change your data. So what we do is we'll, we splash a symbol, an icon that says someone else at another agency has updated this client. Would you like to use this data or would you like to use your data? Okay.
And none whatsoever. So the purpose that I, when I said kind of track homeless clients, I, I, maybe that was partly my fault too. Uh, the purpose of HMIS is to essentially be a central repository for collecting data about homeless individuals in your communities. Now in the case of Delaware County, their continuum is one county. We have 54, so we have to uh, put in some extra levels of protection and uh, data sharing mechanisms to be able to do it properly. But essentially it's the same concept in the sense that we're trying to understand the problem and we're trying to see where a client moves, not just at one agency. We don't want to have the same client be at three separate agencies and be seen as three separate clients. We want to be able to understand each client's needs while at the same time protecting them and protecting their data. That's, those are kind of the two paramount and sometimes uh, two concepts that fight with each other. So that's why we have a lot of the security measures in place. If you, Brian, if you can go to, I think it's slide 14 now. While he's trying to find 14, the other thing too, um, I think is when we were thinking this out, is that there's some, of course you know, there's some counties that have more than one provider that provides a different type of past service. So, Mr. Turner, I'm going to pick on you. The county has a contingency fund that helps people, past clients that are enrolled in another program with some kind of rental assistance. So, in his case, the Three Rivers Youth, we'll say, um, puts in data on that person because they're providing something different. And then Mr. Turner at his, um, at the county level would put in data for that same person. We don't necessarily want to change because each provider provides two different types of service, past service, uh, for that each, for that client. So we still want to give, we want to know, at least I do from a state perspective, that Ben Smith is getting services at Three Rivers Youth and is getting services at um, at the county. The county's paying some kind of money to help him get in, like rental assistance. And, and that's kind of where we came from to be able to have this ability to do that. And that's one of the things that we talked about with Dan is because I know that each county, some counties have more than one. We didn't want one of uh, agency's data to trump another. And we also wanted you to be able to see what other homeless agencies in your area are providing that have nothing to do with that, and vice versa. So that a client, I guess a better way to say this is, is from the very beginning, this has been a very federal driven reporting pain in the ass system that the feds <laughs> said you have to do this. That requirement hasn't changed. However, on the ground level, communities and those of us who run HMIS systems are, are, have realized that this could be a really useful tool for, for not only understanding homelessness at a high level, but also helping communities collaborate together and agencies collaborate together. So we, are, we have been and are continuing over the next few years to move in a direction away from reporting and more toward gathering and sharing useful information to help actually address the client's needs rather than just justify funding. And then also too, at least in Philadelphia, you know, you can have someone, you know, get services in Philadelphia and come across the street, you know, 69th Street and get services in Delaware County. So we wanted to have the ability, at least on our system, as much as we could to be able to see that because you do have people that abuse the system, unfortunately, that will get services and walk across the street, you know, or three blocks down, like in Philadelphia, and go and try to get services there as well. So that's one of the reasons why we, we wanted to go this route, so that we could kind of prevent that. And you can go over the slide for that. I was about to cut you off anyway. We want to let these people go early, remember? <laughs> I'm busted on you. <laughs> All right, so. So uh, we're a few slides down, we're going to have to backtrack, but just kind of the answers to why is it useful? 
And um, I apologize, I'm going to read these. I, I wrote these a long time ago and put them in our user guide, and I don't remember all of them. So um, this is, is this is really more about data sharing, but essentially that's kind of the core of what we're getting down to with an HMIS. So it benefits the client because they don't have to constantly give the same information over and over and over if they have to visit multiple locations. Uh, it helps them be, uh, because if you do a referral and the information is shared, it helps coordinate the case management rather than uh, one agency having to provide all case management. Most of the time, from my experience, each agency specializes in something different. You can help support the client better while also not, you know, uh, training their resources. Um, for the service providers, it allows you to really monitor the client over the, their whole scope of, of services and uh, see where they're moving, what other services they are receiving that maybe you weren't aware of before. It also helps you to not provide the same services that someone else is providing. Um, and hopefully, as more and more agencies are able to collaborate, uh, agencies can help other agencies not use so much of their resources, especially financial resources. Um, it will simplify reporting because at the end of the day, we still do have to justify to HUD, SAMHSA, the VA, et cetera. Um, we have to keep, you know, holding our hands out asking for more money. Uh, for the community, and also in this case for the state, um, it helps deduplicate clients. Um, we can see how many clients in, in a broad area are actually being served. Um, it helps us understand service gaps. Um, maybe clients are not receiving something they could be, or maybe we understand that uh, maybe there's a higher demand for something and more funding needs to be pushed in that direction than we had previously thought. Um, and then, of course, we can use this data to really advocate uh, to lawmakers, uh, policymakers, and, and those who are essentially in control of the dollars that we get. Uh, we can help advocate the need. That's essentially, uh, in a very broad view, the point of HMIS and, and why it's helpful for us all to collaborate together on it. So I'm going to hand it back over to Brian here. Does that answer your question? I'm going to hand it back over to Brian. We're going to um, go back to the client program. And I apologize. I thought that we were already all on the same page about that. But That's all right. I'm glad I put that slide in in retrospect. What's kind of interesting in some of the trainings, we usually sometimes went with the whole theory and everything, but a lot of some of our users were like, well, we just want to know how to put them in the system. So it's kind of good that we're kind of getting that <laughs> up front now that we can kind of hopefully make more sense of why you're putting the data in. Uh, back to the client profile, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, client information has things like date of birth, place of birth, social security number. Uh, now, with date of birth and social security number, you have these uh, data quality fields that you need to kind of fill in um, that shows whether you have full, partial. Um, with date of birth, you know, if you put full, you need to put in a full uh, date of birth date. Um, you also can do approximates or uh, partials. So if you only know like the birth year, you know, you can put in 1960 or estimated age, 75, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's got some options there. Um, Physical characteristics, basically things like ethnicity, and a lot of the options throughout the system are going to have drop downs where you basically select the best choice. Um, also, a lot of the drop downs are going to have, along with the uh, uh, kind of predefined list, like for ethnicity, it's got non Hispanic and Hispanic. We also have like a client doesn't know and a client refused. Um, now, what those are for is it's not if the data person or the intake person kind of goes, well, I don't know what it is, or you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not going to enter that data. That's not what it's specifically for. It's when you ask the client for the data, if they specifically answer, oh, I, I, you know, what's your age, or you know, uh, what's your social security number, and they say, I don't know, or I, I don't want to give that information, that's when you want to choose those. And of course, you always want to try to get as much information as you can to keep the data quality up, so they're kind of the uh, last um, options that you want to try to go for. Um, there's also race, which basically the five uh, federally supported or uh, 
identified races, and if a, someone is multiple um, races, you can select as many um, as you want. Um, kind of like the little check boxes is another way that you enter data in the system. Uh, basic genders, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we also have some additional client information where you can enter in some personal information about the client, state ID, maiden name, language. We also have a housing status, and this is kind of the HUD-based housing status uh, between literally homeless. Uh, it's kind of the difference between people that are homeless and at risk of homeless. Uh, we'll cover this in more detail during the contact section because uh, that's something that you need to fill out on every client's first contact. We'll kind of go over some of the definitions there. As well as veteran status, whether a person is a veteran. Um, if they are a veteran, uh, the system kind of opens up and asks you for military history, kind of their service record. Um, it's kind of done in a uh, service area, like when did they serve. So if a person served in you know, the Gulf area, you would select that and all these dates kind of show what area they're in, kind of answer the questions. Um, now, if they've been in multiple areas, like say, uh, the Gulf and post uh, September 11th, you basically enter the information, hit add, it creates a military history record, and you can add as many records as, as they have. Um, the last section is uh, the contact information, uh, basic street, phone number, email information. It's not super pertinent to any kind of reporting, but it's good information to have um, if you want to collect for the client. Uh, so for this client, we're going to say all we got was basically their gender and their name. That's, that's all we could get from the first contact. Uh, what you do is you basically, when you're ready to create the pro client profile, you can hit save or save it next. Uh, what the system does is we're kind of always going through. Um, it's always going through trying to deduplicate clients in your agency to make sure that you don't put in the client into the system more than once. So as soon as you hit save uh, on the client creation process, it basically looks through your agency again to check of the data you've entered, hey, is there anybody else that's a match? Um, now we've kind of got full matches and partial matches. Now if it's a full match, which is basically the same name and the same full nine-digit social security number, uh, the social security numbers match, we know it's the same person, the system will actually automatically merge those people for you and say, hey, we know that's the guy, it'll bring it right up on the screen. Now for partial matches, we kind of use an algorithm where if it's the same name, you know, if they have the same date of birth or gender, what we do up here is we kind of throw up all the partial matches just to kind of almost like the search to kind of get it in front of you to say, hey, um, system notice these might be, and it's the same Benjamin Smith that we noticed before, uh, uh, to kind of try to get you to uh, use that person again. Now, if it's not that person, you can go ahead and hit save again. If it is, you click on it again, and the system again will load that information and kind of merge the existing with what you better hear. Now, we know it's the same guy, but we're going to actually pretend that we, you know, it's not because we're going to go on to kind of a third level of duplication that we have. We've got a lot of deduplication uh, options into the system. Uh, we're going to go ahead and hit save. And that only happens if there is a match. If there's no match, you'll just go straight into save. And as you see here, um, you'll kind of say, hey, client profile is saved. Um, it kind of has each section broken up into who saved the information when it was last saved, some information there for tracking. And uh, that's how you create a client in the system. Now, for PATH, and we'll get into that in the next section, you'll see here we've got a little outreach contact tracker. Now, that only appears after the client has been created. And this is kind of where, you know, you've collected, you know, their name and gender, and you want to go in and collect their contact information there. So you need to make sure that the client is created or there's an existing profile to do that. So we've talked about two levels of kind of deduplication, the initial client lookup, as well as when you create the client, there's actually a third and final level, and it is on any time uh, you update the client profile, if you update certain personal information like change their name, uh, enter their social security number, gender, date of birth, uh, since we do allow partial profiles, um, we can't just do it on the creation because with this client, there's not a really enough information to really tell if there's someone else in the, in the agency. So let's say you meet with the client again, and this time you get their date of birth. Um, so we're going to go ahead and enter their date of birth. 82. Um, and anytime you enter any, any information there, all you have to do is make sure you hit save on the bottom of the page. 
And the system then again does another search through the system. And again, we have the full and the partial matches. If it finds a full match, which is full social security, it will automatically merge that client and kind of tell you, hey, we merged the client, we found you know, duplicates in here, and it will bring you up and say, hey, here's the best possible information. Now, the system uses a pretty good algorithm of a uh, combination between the most complete data and the most recent data. Um, but if you do see that, we do advise to kind of have a quick run over the profile. Computer can only do so much, so that's why we need your help uh, to kind of eyeball the clients. You should, you know, uh, have the information at your hand uh, to know who your clients are and what their best information is. Now, as you can see here, for those that are partials again, um, we can see, hey, the system noticed, hey, there's a partial match in the system, which is probably that Benjamin Smith that we've been we've been seeing before. Um, it basically shows you um, a kind of a link here. Uh, that basically flags that client um, that says, hey, you should take a look at this. Now, anytime you see that, um, what we've done is we've built an actual client merge tool into the profile where it basically allows you to walk through some steps of manually merging these clients if they happen to be duplicates. Because it's not a full match, so we're not positive of all the information. We need your help to make that selection. So we're going to go ahead and click on this link. And what it does is it kind of brings you to a little standalone uh, client merge tool where it shows here's all the partial matches. And as you can see, this is the Ben Smith we're on, and then there's that Benjamin Smith that keeps popping up that the system wants us to deal with. Uh, now, it could be two people. There could be three or four duplicates in your system, depending on um, you know, what mistakes have been entered. Um, now, with partial matches, it basically gives you the two options. Um, if you think that these are definite matches and you want to merge them saying, hey, I want to take care of this, you basically select them and you hit display merge info. That's basically saying, hey, I know these are the same people, I want to merge them. Now, since the system is just going, hey, this is partial information, you know, we, we need your help, we're not sure. If you look at them and go, well, I know those aren't the same people, um, you can always hit unflag duplicates and the system will basically unflag them and take your word for it say, okay, they're not the same people, we'll leave them in the system as is. Now, under this situation, uh, we should have actually figured that out from the lookup and the first uh, uh, client creation, but we kind of wanted to follow through with all the steps. We do know that this is the same person. So we're going to go ahead and finally merge them. So we hit the display merge info, and it basically, here's the two clients, and it kind of creates the best client record for what the system thinks uh, from you know, the most complete data versus what's the most updated. And it allows you basically any data that's different. As you can see here, the names are different. And it allows you to select you know, uh, what you think the best data is for this client profile. So I'm going to go ahead and pick Benjamin since so that was already in the system. Everything else is the same, um, so they match across the board. You basically update the record, so that's the final record that we're going to merge, and you basically hit confirm merge, and we always, uh, always like to do con uh, uh, conf confirmations within the system. You hit save, and the system basically goes through a merge where it, uh, it basically creates a client profile of that old, uh, old, you know, the old client, existing client with the new client. And as you can see here, uh, you know, the old client had social security number, he had a race filled in, had some other information. So now that kind of is a way to uh, kind of how the merge works in the system. So if you ever see that flag, you want to kind of take a look at it to see whether it's a duplicate or not. If, if you, if you had. Uh, the question was, if you make a mistake, can you unmerge? If you notice how, how many times we asked, are you sure you would like to merge? The answer is no. On this merge, the two old records are deleted and the new one is created. <laughs> That's a good question, though. <laughs> no, no question is a stupid question. <laughs> and that is pretty much, uh, in a nutshell, how you create a client. You know, you go through your searching and everything like that. And as you get more information, um, you'll basically, um, as we go here. I do, want to, I, I, I do want to say one other thing in relation to that. We have two separate versions of the client merge. One we'll get into later with the agency manager, but there's, there's a merge that agency managers have access to that is much more robust. General day-to-day -day caseworker type of users will only have the option to merge if the system thinks that there is a match. 
So you won't actually see this that much. However, each user does have a responsibility to help, uh, you know, make sure that the data is clean as possible. So we created this tool. If the system thinks that there's a, a, a potential conflict, it will alert you and you'll be able to do something about it. Otherwise, it's up to the agency manager. And as you can see here, after we created the client, you can see uh, Benjamin Smith is now on my caseload because I created him and merged to them. So anytime you know you meet with them again, you have more information. You come to the client profile and you just update it and fill out information. Hit save again, and that's kind of how the client profile um, works within the system. Now we're going to kind of go on to the uh, outreach contacts portion. I don't like using that mic like stand. <laughs> I've got to use it. I know. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, hold on. Let me, let, me, let me come back. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Amanda, you better run. Or eat me until they're leaving early time. <laughs> I'll be quick. Opposed to me stumbling upon another agency's entry of a person, is there another way for me to see what other agencies in my county are using Agent You said besides? Uh, besides me putting in somebody's name and seeing another agency's entry, is there another way for me to find out what other agencies in my county are using Agent Maya? Yes. And I there's, can, there's the yeah. yeah, I can actually show you. Now, you, you, can't really, you can't really see another agency's client. You, you can't just see all clients at another agency. Because kind of show you here, because when you do, say we want to search for Ben Smith again, when it comes up, you'll basically, here's your agency client, so that's what you own. Now, down here is that same Ben Smith here. So if we click on that, that's kind of a global record. This is kind of all their shared information from, it could be just you, it could be multiple agencies, um, but this is also where you can import them. I kind of wanted to cover that. Uh, but we have an agency resource directory here that you can load that basically you can do a search, say, hey, I want to see shelters. Um, basically, you can look in your county, say you're in Armstrong, um, where you can pull up and it'll show all the participating agencies in the system. And you can click on that agency, and as you can see, here's Armstrong Community Action, and it shows all their programs, uh, contact information there. So that resource directory is a, is a good tool to kind of see who's out there, other contact information within the system. And over time, this will be built more and more depending on uh, how many agencies increase participation and what information we have. Okay. Uh, another quick question. Let me hold it up. But is there a way for me to quickly show me in the demographic part or somewhere else what funding resources I've used on that person or would I have to read all the case notes that another agency put in? Okay, well, there are two, two things here. First of all, HMIS was never intended to track funding. Uh, however, recently we've uh, realized that there is a need to track funding, and so we started to incorporate that in, specifically right now around the Emergency Solutions Grant Program and now PATH. However, if you're in your agency working with your client, you can run reports to see what you've provided them, but as far as actual funding sources that are available to another agency, that's not yet in the system. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I recently read uh, that Hunt has a new rule regarding universal data. Is your universal data that, uh, well, that's a, another good question, one I was trying to stay away from, but yes, um, uh, HUD has published new regulations. What we're training you on right now will be changing, and we will be, 
We will be keeping it, all our users up to date, um, but we uh, are required um, by law to update the data as, as HUD requires. So uh, they have not yet posted the final version of the new data standards. And so once they do, we'll have six or eight months or so to comply with those regulations to uh, update the system to collect data in the new format. Actually, actually the, the question that, that was asked is demographics are broken down differently for PATH than they are for HUD. We know that. And also, um, we're essentially forcing you to comply with the HUD way. And the reason for that is because I, I sit on a software provider group that works with HUD directly. And um, essentially, the federal agencies that collaborate are, are part of a, uh, a federal effort. They, they essentially have created a group to all work together. It includes HHS, the VA, HUD, Department of Education, on and on. And uh, because HUD spearheaded this years ago, um, the other federal agencies are going to be complying with HUD's method of collecting the data. And then in turn, HUD will be adding extra data elements specific to those programs. So specifically about your demographic questions you're asking, uh, HHS will no longer be collecting the information in the format you're used to. They'll be collecting it in the HUD manner. Okay, thank you. Yep. Oh, actually, I was supposed to be talking more about it. Contact. <laughs> this is good. I'm glad you guys were interacting. We were, we were worried it was going to be a yawn fest. <coughs> All right, so we're going to talk about a piece that was specifically implemented just for PATH. And the reason I say that so strongly is because some of you uh, in the room will have access to not only the PATH program, but also other programs that you've been working with HMIS for a long time. And this, this piece, this contact tracker essentially, is a piece that you should only use for PATH right now. So if you are a user that has access to PATH and a HUD-funded transitional housing program, for instance, you're going to see this contact tracker. If you're enrolling, if you're going to be using the system to enroll in your HUD-funded program, don't use this. You're going to be using it for PATH, use this. <coughs> Essentially, that's the long and short of kind of what it says on that slide. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Brian now to go over what is actually collected. This is a quick list of the contact data elements, and we're going to go over them kind of one by one throughout the system. Again, this is kind of for the benefit of people having a list, knowing what they need to collect on a per contact basis, as well as for those um, using another HMIS system. So we're going to go back into the, uh, the demo. And uh, we're going to go ahead and pick back up with uh, our Benjamin Smith, um, which you can just load, of course, straight from the client profile. Um, I do want to say one thing. Um, while we're talking about this, this contact piece, one flaw of the HUD data standards is that they only provide one opportunity to collect a contact and an engagement. And so this piece, especially for those of you who will be going back to work with other HMIS systems, this might be something that, that your HMIS system will need to figure out how to do. Uh, it was very important to DPW to be able to track um, every instance of a contact. And frankly, uh, your federal reporting uh, will require us to report this. So what we had to do is create kind of a, a, a brand new method uh, that did, did not fully comply with HUD. Um, to, to collect this information. So what he's going to show you, uh, again, I'm just going a long way around saying this is only for PATH. Um, if, you're, if you are working on a HUD program, please follow the usual methods. And uh, for PATH roles or DPW, every single contact that you have with a client pre-enrollment should be recorded in the system. You know, whether it is an actual street outreach, whether it's a social service event like in-reach, an appointment, walk-in, referral, phone call. Um, since on the past annual report, they not only 
report number, you know, people contacted, but the number of total contacts. Uh, that's why they need to be recorded um, uh, individually. So here's basically the path contact tracker, and of course, like I said, again, it's only available to those who are actually those users that are actually administering PATH. Um, so for those agencies that might have multiple programs, you know, if you're a PATH user, you know, uh, you'll see it on your screen. That's why another user might say, hey, what's that? Why isn't that on my screen? It's because they do not administer the PATH program through the system. There's two basic options here. We tried to make it uh, it's, uh, kind of as separated as simple as possible. There's an add new contact as well as what we call a view update, update contact history. Basically the ad is simply what it is, it is when you have a new meeting with the client. Uh, you basically click this button, um, it pops up, and I'll show you in a second. You enter a contact with the information. The view basically is a way to view existing or previous contacts, either just review them, edit them, delete them, um, a lot of options with your history. So let's say we're going to create a new contact. Basically, the system kind of creates a, a little pop-up screen here uh, that has all the different data elements that you need to collect. Now, all of them are the same per contact except for this housing status, uh, which we'll get into, which is only collected at first contact. Uh, the first one is type of contact, and it basically uh, describes uh, the environment of the contact. Was it one-on-one -on -one, or was it in some kind of a group setting? Um, now, depending on how you select this one, the next one is the method of contact, and it changes a little bit. Uh, as you can see, and the method of contact is basically describes uh, how the contact between the caseworker and the client occurred. Uh, there's four in-person types, um, outreach, service event, uh, office appointment walk-in, and then there's four by phone and by email options, which are you know, between the client from referring to referring agency. So you need to select, you know, how the contact occurred. Now what's important with this is while we want to track every single contact, whether it's an outreach or referral, PATH is very, or CIS is very concerned with what we call outreach contacts. Now, the outreach contacts, the only methods that are considered outreach are the in-person street outreach, and the in-person social service event. Um, street outreach is basically, you know, out on the street. Well, a social service event can be what we consider in reach per your definition. Um, on path reporting, when we talk about contacts and reporting number of people contact and number of contacts, they're looking all at outreaches. Um, so you need to make sure that you're selecting the right contact when you're entering it into the system. So we're going to say that this is, go ahead, this is a street outreach. Um, first contact, because um, it kind of can evolve. You'll have street outreach, street outreach, you know, you could have five street outreaches, and then the last one could be maybe all an appointment that you make for them or a phone call from the client, so it's kind of a, a process. Then you have the location of contact, basically where did the contact occur. You have three basic selections, uh, place not meant for habitation, which is things like on the streets, outdoors, uh, service setting, non-residential, um, as well as service setting, residential. Um, so you select the one that best uh, explains where, the, where you met. Uh, then here's the housing status of first contact. As we kind of explained, it was on the profile itself. Uh, this is actually, PATH is using the HUD definitions for housing status, and this is only collected during the first contact. Each subsequent contact, you will not have to collect this information. And it's made up of four main housing statuses, which are literally homeless, eminently losing their housing, unstably housed, as well as stably housed. Now, the way it kind of breaks up is it's kind of the homeless definition. You know, anybody that is literally homeless, like on the street, outdoors, place not meant for human habitation, that's what we call literally homeless. Now, if someone is just at risk of homelessness, uh, which are clients that are currently homeless, but they're, they're very much at risk, you know, they're uh, living with a family member, a friend, Maybe they're being discharged from an institution, jail, uh, a, a hospital. Um, there you need to either choose imminently losing their housing or unstably um, housed. And they're kind of the same. They both kind of define an at risk. It's kind of the difference between the two is a severity. Um, we kind of use, you know, if they're going to lose, you know, if you think they're at risk of losing their housing within the last 30 days, imminently losing their housing is what you want to select. While if they're 
uh, at risk of losing their housing within 90 days, that's when you want to select unstably housed. Um, then, of course, stably housed is someone that is stably housed, so um, if you're selecting that, they're probably not going to be eligible for the PATH uh, program. We're going to select literally homeless. Uh, length of contact, this is how long did the contact take place, and you basically just enter a text box for a number of minutes. So we'll say this is a quick one. I don't know the exact time frames. We'll put 15 minutes. Um, the last one uh, is client eligibility for PATH services. Um, basically, it enters during that contact, you know, uh, if you did eligibility, what was it? Um, and if they were eligible, did they accept or refuse the services? Now, if it is a quick first contact, odds are you're probably not going to have time to do an assessment and do eligibility. So we do have an eligibility not determined uh, selection that you can choose. Now, if you do have time to do eligibility during an assessment, we have either not eligible for services, or they could be eligible and they either refuse the services or they're eligible and accepted the services. Um, so those are the four selections that you can put in. Now, before a client can be enrolled into a program, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit during the enrollment as well, a client must have at least one contact in the system and their last contact needs to be eligible and accepted services. So basically, you need to have done the eligibility, plus they need to accept it before the system will allow you to actually enroll them into the PATH program where they can be provided with services and referrals. Uh, data contact, that is basically when the contact took place, pretty straightforward. Now, since contacts could happen multiple times during the day, it's not only the date, um, which you can actually you know, type in, um, as well as use the calendar function here. Um, we'll just say this happened. Uh, a week ago, but it also is a time as well. Um, so you can just enter in the time. And if you need an AM or PM, you basically hit P or A behind it to kind of switch it uh, to when you actually met with them. You've got a note section, which can be optional. Uh, but once you're done entering all that, you basically hit complete, and uh, that is basically it, and that's how you create a contact. Um, uh, What's your question? Other staff about PATH, 
we keep it for our own personal, but it's not something that's necessarily reported in our, you know, to the Fed. And that's what I've been telling you guys all along. So it's those face-to-face -face contact. So Kristen, if, if Ms. Adrian is speaking with 50 people and she gets 50 names, um, then she would have to put that in the system. Yes. Okay, this is actually a good question. The, the question that was asked is how does the system determine, essentially, if I'm understanding correctly, how does the system determine that the client is eligible? The, the answer is the system does not do that for you. Um, we have, have to trust that, obviously, you guys know this program way better than we do. <laughs> and you know what is eligible and what isn't. As far as enrolling the client into a program, which we'll get to later, the, what the system needs to know is that you have determined that they're eligible and that they've received services. So in that contact tracker, the option, if you select any other option other than eligible and accepted services, the system will not allow you to enroll them in a program. However, what actually determines eligibility at the man's expertise. You guys know that. It's the, it's the diagnosis and the housing status. There is a place, I don't know where you guys have it, that you can input a diagnosis. You would have to do that. There's no way the system's going to know because you're going to click eligible. You still have to do your due diligence. But there is a place where we do put, I don't know what screen it's on, where we put the diagnosis information. Well, we'll get to that later, but it's actually been removed, if you remember. We have to we collect health information and part of that is mental health. So the specific diagnosis. Yeah. We don't go up. But we do have a place for middle. Yes. Middle yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hold on one second here first. That's a question for you, Amanda. Um, on our monthly report, are we reporting people that we outreached and we found were homeless that weren't mentally ill and said they weren't eligible in the monthly reporting? Because I've been putting them. I don't, I don't know about your monthly, you have to talk to your county folks about your monthly or your agency people. What we want to know is, and they do want to know, those ones that you outreach to that you got that basic information that were not enrolled because they were not eligible. So you still want to know that. We have one back here, Dan. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to put diagnosis in the system that violates HIPAA violations with that. And in addition to, I think the question you had about the outreach, um, we can pull up the county, so we use, use this a lot. We also have an outreach data, database system that we use. It's always good because you come across individuals that may give you their first name, but don't give you the last. Where they have the characters at, it's a good time to put in the description of that location where you engage that person. And after you build that relationship, and once they come back and give you that last name, you can go back and enter that full name to that file, and there's um, there's a segment in HMIS where you can roll that file all into the one person to show that's the same contact that you're using for that individual. Because there, when you're dealing with outreach homes, there they may be skeptical about giving you their information. So it's always good to use that character box to really describe the location where you met that person at. Um, we always use it for like clothes or anything. That person let us know over the time once we get their last name, we can go back to that file and enter the correct data. Yep, and that's, and that's something too to, to touch on is if, if you don't have enough information at first and you create kind of a, a, a just a very general client that the system can't deduplicate, that client will show up on your caseload and you'll be able to continue to access that to continue to update the information that you collect it. So that's, that's kind of an ongoing process, and that's the caseworker's responsibility, essentially. I do want to address one thing that got brought up. It does not violate HIPAA to collect anything, essentially. Uh, it does not violate, if, if we wanted, or if Amanda wanted us to collect diagnosis information, that does not violate HIPAA, where we could potentially get into trouble, and what we would not do would be share that information. Sharing that information with another agency about a specific health diagnosis 
would violate HIPAA. So I just want to make, uh, make a clear distinction that, and the reason I make this distinction is because some people are, are worried um, about collecting certain pieces of some sensitive information. And if two years from now, DBW or the Feds want to collect something that is potentially sensitive, part of the conversation we would have is whether or not that information could be shared. So we would still protect that information. So you will be able to put in a mental health, click mental health for a client, correct? Yes. All right. No that's diagnosis, that's but mental health. Huh? No diagnosis, but mental uh, health. We currently do not collect diagnosis. Okay. Yes, one last question and then we're going to take a break here. So, say you have someone in a general logistics based situation where they just give you limited information and then as you get to know them, you find out the full name and then you can um, update the record, make the past contact, the merge the, the full name, and so the record is updated for your agency's record. What is, uh, other agency starts working with that person, and you know again, uh, the person is only giving an alias or, or whatever. Would they be able? Mm -hmm. Like, does the system keep track of like the old alias name in the search? Essentially, the, the question he's asking is if if I if did I just turn this off? Yeah, let's go. check, 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 check. I think the battery's died. Hello. Hello. The question he's asking is about uh, keeping the client record updated. If you don't have enough information to keep it updated at first, um, and simultaneously another agency doesn't have enough information to make a full client record, what happens? And, and the answer is that the, the system does not see those two clients, the same client, until there's a bare minimum amount of information that the system can use to determine that the clients are the same. So in your example, if you had a gym and his last name was no last name or don't know or you know and another agency had something similar the system would have no idea they're the same clients until you you both continue to update the information at which point once there's enough information updated on both sides the system will recognize it and then uh, we'll start to link those together but I guess the question is deeper than that Remember past information. Then, so like a name, something would update. So it kind of changes it. But what it remembers is the old thing that you have, or is that erased? If you are, if, yeah. so you're saying if you updated, if if their last name was Jello, and then you updated it to Smith, right. the the new name would be Smith. It would not recommend or remember Jello unless you type it in the alias field method there. Oh, there is an alias. Field. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a name and an alias field. All right, uh, we were going to get into the data sharing stuff, which we started to touch on, but we're going to take a quick break um, at, at 10:30. Here, here's the deal. Um, how many of you need, still need to check out? Oh, no, no. Okay. I was going to try to finish um, contact. We can do one of two things. You can go do that and use that as your break time, or we can go to 11. You guys make the call. Well, we're going to 11. So check out, and then we'll see you back at 11, and we'll get started.